Good morning. Thank you for joining us once again for this online version of worship at First Presbyterian. As we gather in the next few moments, I just simply invite you as the music begins to play to take this as a moment to let go. To let go of all the worries about when we're going to open or we open or how the testing is or oh that sore throat that you've been having that you wonder if this is it. We all have sore throats these days. Don't worry about it. Just take a moment to take a deep breath and let all that stuff go. Imagine it's in your hand and you're just dropping it down so that in these moments you might experience the presence of this God who is always with us, even in these days. Let us prepare all that we are for the worship of God. Let us come to God in prayer. Loving and gracious God, we give you thanks that you are the risen one, that your love conquers everything, even death. And Lord, as we come to this season, this season, what is called Easter tide, we pray in these moments that you might surround us with your love, that in these moments we might become open to how deeply and completely you do love us so that in the depth and completeness of that love, as we experience it, as we feel it surrounding us, holding us, filling us, that in that love, not only may we grow to love you more deeply and completely, but in the power of that love, we may grow to love ourselves and all those whom you place around us more deeply and completely as well. So that in that love, Lord, we might experience your assurance, your peace, your power, and your transformation. So that, Lord, we might be those who go forth to share that love in whatever way we can in these socially distanced days, through emails and text and phone calls and Zoom calls and all the ways in which we stay connected to one another. And may we know in every way that you are connected with us and that your love is with us in every moment. And in Jesus' name we pray it. And everybody, wherever you are, said, amen. Now, as we come, let us join in our opening song as we sing together, being led by one of our great soloists. Today is Javon Brown with the song, Christ is Alive. Thank you, Javon. I love that last line. Love drowned in death shall never die. And what better time to remember the resurrection than these moments after Easter, even in these challenging days. And so I invite you to join with me in a prayer written just last century 
by a wonderful and profound religious believer, Christian disciple, and amazing pioneer, a man named Brother Roger. Let us pray together this prayer. If you were not risen, Lord Christ, to whom would we go to discover a radiance of the face of God? If you were not risen, we would not be together seeking your communion. We would not find in your presence forgiveness, wellspring of a new beginning. If you were not risen, where would we draw the energy for following you right to the end of our existence, for choosing you again and anew? May we choose your love each day, and may we rest in your grace when in our choices we fall short. In your name we pray. Amen. I invite you to take a few moments simply to rest in silence and maybe remember a time when you have experienced God's love, the radiance of it, the beauty of it in a powerful way. And just rest in those moments in these times of silence. As we gather, as we do each week at these waters of baptism, we can remember that God's love is there for us in every moment, in every challenge, even in the moments where we lose touch with that love, when we lose touch with the best parts of ourselves, and we fall short not only of God's expectations, but of our own. But in these moments, I invite you to remember that God's love is there for you, that it is unshakable, that it is undefeatable, that it triumphs over everything, even death itself. And I invite you to remember, not only in Jesus' name are you forgiven, but in Jesus' name you can know that God loves you each of you, wherever you are, God loves you no matter what. Amen? That is such good news. It's important that we take a moment to sing once again together. I invite you to hear once again Javon as he leads us in a song of celebration. And as we gather, I invite you to hear from Javon again as he sings this profound song based upon a passage in Scripture. There is a balm in Gilead. There is a balm that makes the wounded whole. And in these days where we're so worried about our health, we can remember that God is present with us in the midst of that. That God, too, as Jesus has often been called, is a great physician. The physician of our heart and of our soul and of our body, too. I invite you to listen to Javon.
dead gum. Now you know you had church right there. Thank you so much, Javon. That was amazing. And each week, uh, we will be here uh, to share with you a, a powerful worship experience so that you might know that God is present with you in these days. But we're not just here each week. We're here every day. Literally every day, if you go to our Facebook page, you will find something new, uh, a labyrinth walk that I might have taken that day, um, information on our children's ministries and things that you can do with your kids and crafts. And this coming week, we're going to be offering a first Zoom Wombalan. That's right. Your kids can Zoom in with Coach Daniel and check in and hear the, the message for this week. And just uh, talk a little bit about sharing any crafts or anything you've done uh, during uh, these days of social distancing. And keep in mind that every Sunday at 11 a.m., we do a Zoom check-in and Bible study. And if you go to our Facebook page and look for the Zoom picture, you will be able to click on that link and it should take you right there. And the vision for our church is invited, welcomed, and loved. And so sometimes if Zoom is not functioning exactly well or may require a password because sometimes it does sometimes it doesn't just know this the password will always be this word invited capital i invited because you're always invited here you're always welcomed and you're always loved and we're so glad that you joined us for this youtube version of our worship today speaking of all of this online stuff. I gotta admit, I've been a little surprised. Who'd have thunk it? But it seems that these walks that I mentioned that I take, I, every day, Monday through Friday, I, at noon, take a walk on the labyrinth that's just right behind our sanctuary building. And it seems a lot of people like to look at those. In fact, more people like to look at those than like to look at this service. Sometimes three times as many, one time over ten times as many watch one of those walks. Now, I don't know the reason for that. Maybe it's because they are only taught for six minutes than here when I talk a little bit longer than that. But if you've watched those labyrinth walks, you know that as I reach the center of the labyrinth, there's a moment where I typically tip the phone up which is what I'm recording things on. And I kind of look around. And in the middle of that look around, something always catches my eye. And the thing that always catches my eye, what it fills me with kind of a little sense of awe. It gives me a, a feeling of comfort, of peace even. And you know, the more I thought about it, the more I realized... It kind of makes sense. I mean, that thing that I notice each day when I walk the labyrinth is a huge part of Scripture. In fact, no other living thing appears in Scripture more often, except for God and people, than this living thing that I notice each week. In fact, you will find this thing on the first page of the Bible. You will find it on the last page of the Bible. You will find it in the very first Psalm. You will find it on the very first page of the New Testament. In fact, there is no major event in the Bible that does not have this thing in some way connected to it. Now, as cool as that is, this living thing that shows up in all of these places shows up there because God knows it has power. It has power to connect you more deeply to God, to yourself and to one another, and even to the world around you. And it has power to give you a profound sense of peace and even joy, even in these challenging days. So, where can you find this living thing that carries such power? Well, in these words, God shows you the way. So let's listen and hear 
what God has to say as our scripture passage this morning comes from the very first book of the Bible, beginning in the first chapter of the book of Genesis. Listen and hear the word of the Lord. God said, see, behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is upon the face of all the earth and every tree with seed in its fruit. You shall have them for food. And to every beast of the earth and to every bird of the air and to everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has the breath of life, I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. God saw everything that he had made. And indeed, it was very good. Then, from Genesis chapter 2. Then the Lord God formed man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And the man, the Adam, became a living being. And the Lord God planted a garden in Eden in the east, and there he put this Adam whom he had formed. Out of the ground, the Lord God made to grow every tree that is planted to the site that is uh, every tree that is pleasant, rather, to the site and good for food. The tree of life in the midst of the garden, and also the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now the Lord God took this man, the Adam, and put him in the garden of Eden to till it and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the Adam, You may freely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of, knowledge, of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For the day you eat of it, you shall die. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Now, now have you guessed it? Have you guessed what living thing carries such power that you find mention of them everywhere in the Bible? What I just read probably gives you a pretty good clue. This living thing beyond people that gets more mention than anything else in the Bible are trees. But now that you know that, you can ask, so what? Yes, I mean, it gives you a, a good answer to a Bible trivia question, but what does it do for you beyond that? What does it matter that at the beginning of the whole story, the key choice that the first human beings face is a choice between two trees? It matters a lot. See, in fact, in that choice, you find not only the way to a life of peace and joy, of a life that is truly life, but in that choice, you also find what will lead you away from that life. You find what lies at the heart of the brokenness and of the pain and the heartache of the human condition. Before you get to that choice, you need first to understand why God focuses on trees this much. See, trees don't just have a central place in the biblical story. Trees have a central place in kind of the story of everything, in the whole story of this planet, and also your story. See, living in the planet, we take for granted that stuff lives. You know, plants live, bugs live, our pets live, we live. But as far as we know, all this living stuff we take for granted, it exists nowhere else in the universe but here. Now, yes, we guess that something must be living out there somewhere. I mean, the universe is a very, very big place. But we haven't found it yet. We have found nothing else alive, not even something microscopic anywhere else but on this planet. But on this planet, sheesh, life happens everywhere. Life even happens underneath your fingernails. And in the Bible, when God wants to focus on the plants, 
on these living things that lie at the center of all that lives, God focuses on trees. And that makes sense. Right now, wherever you are, you are breathing trees. It's what we call the carbon cycle. You probably learned about it in fifth grade science or whatever science class you took in elementary school. But up until a few hundred years ago, human beings didn't know that. We had no idea where the stuff we breathe actually came from. People speculated that it might have come from the rocks. If you've ever seen the mist rising from rocks in the morning somewhere, you might say, oh, that's how they got that idea. That's how they did. But any scientist, if you talked to them 300 years ago and said, you know, I think the oxygen that we breathe, it, it, it comes from the trees. <laughs> they would have laughed at you. They would have said, that's crazy. But go figure. It's true. The sun shines on the trees. The trees produce all sorts of cool stuff. Energy, sugars that we use to nourish our energies and keep us moving. And oxygen, the very air we breathe. And pretty much still, every kid learns about that in elementary school. But do you get what it means? Let me clarify it for you. If human beings disappeared from the face of the earth tomorrow, trees would be okay. They'd just keep on going, doing what trees do. But if trees disappear from the face of the earth tomorrow, every human being on the planet would soon die. That's how crucial they are. So when God talks about planting a tree of life, God is not simply giving you a nice image. God is painting for you a picture of what is profoundly true, of what is totally and completely real. In fact, right inside of you, right now, you have a sort of tree. In fact, Cynthia is going to shoot to a picture now to show you that. Now, until recently, scientists weren't really able to grasp what the inside of our lungs look like. But now we know. They look like this picture. I put it upside down so you can see it a little bit more clearly. But let me ask you, does that look like anything you've ever seen before? It's why they call it a bronchial tree. That literally inside of our very bodies, we have a sort of tree that enables us to breathe. And in this scripture, and in the wonder of these trees that surround us everywhere, God is telling you something absolutely, crucially important. Everything, everything is connected to everything else. Everything is dependent on everything else. There is no such thing as independence anywhere in nature and even among us. I mean, if we didn't realize that before, we sure realize it now. I mean, this crisis has taught us just how interdependent we are as people. Every day, we now realize how many thousands of people it takes simply to keep us alive, for us to simply live, not just the folks who check us out at the grocery store or who maybe deliver those groceries to our door, but also all those people who are growing those things, who are picking those things, who are packaging those living things, and who are driving or flying all of that stuff to us. And that's where the other tree comes in. The tree that God warned Adam about. You may ask, I mean, what makes that tree so bad? I mean, what is so bad about the knowledge of good and evil? It sounds kind of like a good thing, right? Right? Well, years ago, two writers, John Eldridge and Brent Curtis, shared an insight that answered, for me at least, that very question. Eldridge and Curtis wrote this. 
Satan's seduction of our heart always comes in the form of a story that offers us greater control through knowing good and evil rather than the unknowns of relationship. Now, why do we want this control, this knowledge of good and evil? Why do we want to know? Because with relationship, it can feel like you never really know. You never really know what's happening in the relationship, what's going on with that other person. So you have to trust that you know, at least enough. And trust can feel scary. But in this tree, and the command that God gives about it, God is asking human beings that very question. God is asking them, will you trust me? Will you trust me enough to believe what I am telling you about this tree? Are you willing to depend on me like that, to depend upon my wisdom and counsel towards you? That I am sharing with you, even if you don't completely understand why. And these days, we've had to do a lot of that sort of trusting. We've had to do that when folks tell us that we need to socially distance or we need to wear a mask or we need to wash our hands at least 20 seconds, if not more. Now, we may not completely understand all of the reasons behind those things, but we do simply trust that they're telling us those things in order to keep us alive to keep our loved ones alive, to keep everyone alive and healthy. And trust, trust there, trust everywhere. More than you might realize, well, trust kind of holds everything together. Trust holds marriages together. Trust holds families together. Trust holds nations together. And if trust isn't there, That's a pretty weak nation. And to a large extent, trust holds this whole world together. But if you know the story, Adam and Eve don't choose to trust. They didn't trust this God. This God who had given them literally everything, even life itself. And why? They wanted control. They wanted to know. They wanted to be the ones in charge. And this desire for control, this unwillingness to trust God or each other or even ourselves, this lack of trust, it is what messes the world up all over the place. It is the heart of the human problem. And why do people not trust In the end, it comes down to fear. Adam and Eve did not trust God because they feared. They feared that God was holding out on them, that God did not really have their best interest at heart, that God didn't truly and completely love them. And ever since, people have been caught up in the same fear. They have believed the same lie. You can't trust God. You can't trust anyone, really. But here's the painful truth, or maybe the positive truth. You cannot get away from trust. No one can. Right now, As I'm speaking, as you're listening, you're depending on the trees right outside your window to help you breathe for the very air that you take into your lungs. 
You are living literally on that trust right now. Every day, you are trusting countless things outside of your control simply to keep you alive. You know, as scary as this coronavirus is, it can obscure the miracles of protection that happen every day inside your body. Literally every day, your body kills off something that could seriously harm or even kill you. And you don't even know it. Your antibodies notice it, they attack it, they get rid of it, and you are none the wiser. And fairly soon, in a year or two, hopefully sooner, with a little help from science, your antibodies will recognize this virus too and protect you from it. But right now, antibodies are already protecting you. Every day, in countless ways, you are living on trust. And you can do that because the God who created this amazing world is absolutely trustworthy. You can trust because this God does truly, completely, really love you. In fact, this God loves you more than you could even imagine or comprehend. And you know that because of a tree, too. Hundreds of years ago, an extraordinary poet lived named uh, George Herbert. And one of his most famous poems is called The Sacrifice. And in it, Herbert creates a, a, a narrative where Jesus is meditating upon his suffering and, and sharing what his suffering means and how profound it was for him to go through the agony of the cross. And in the middle of this poem, Herbert wrote these lines. Oh, all you who pass by, behold and see Man stole the fruit, but I must climb the tree, the tree of life to all, except for me. I want you to hear those lines again. Oh, all you who pass by, behold and see. Man stole the fruit, but I I, Jesus, must climb the tree, the tree of life for all, except for me. And Jesus, God gave up the tree of life for him. It became the tree of death so that you might have that tree of life again and have it forever. And Jesus, God gave up everything so you might have everything that ultimately matters. So that you might know that God does love you. That God loves you even more than life itself. And because everything is connected, this sacrifice of God in Jesus, this radical gift has saved you, has changed everything for you. It means right now, if you are alone in your home, you are not alone. You are never, ever alone. You are always connected to this God. And through this God and His love to everyone around you, even to this creation that surrounds you, even the trees outside your window because you live in a world that is shaped and ordered ultimately by that love. A love you can trust. A love that has even defeated death. 
And as you trust in that love, you will see it more and more. You will see it in the people walking around you, even if you see them outside of your windows. You will see it in the words of Scripture that proclaim this love on every page. You will feel it in the presence and comfort that God plants within you. You can even experience it in the trees that surround you. And as you behold this love, you will discover more and more this God filling you. Filling you with more peace, with more joy, with more love than you could have imagined possible. So trust in the love. For as you do, you will discover life. Life that is truly life. Life that is more abundant even in these days than you could have ever imagined or dreamed. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, we give you thanks that you are the God who loves us more than we could ever imagine. And every moment of every day, we can see signs of that love in the sun that rises each morning, in the trees that literally fill us with the breath of life, in all the beauty of this world, and all the wonders of the bodies in which we live and which we are, in the people that surround us, and in your love for us, which we see so profoundly in Jesus, who came and lived among us and healed our sickness and gave us your wisdom and loved us, sitting at table with us and becoming our friend and who out of that love climbed, climbed onto that tree, that cross of Calvary, and gave everything for us. But that, Lord, nothing could defeat that love, not even death itself. And so we can know that your love will bring us through these days, and we pray for those who are in the midst of them in particularly challenging ways. We pray for those who are sick above all, and we pray for healing for them and strength. We pray, Lord, for those caring for them, all those, Lord, in the front lines of health care, that you will watch over and protect them and give them the strength and wisdom they need to care for these folks and bring them out of their crisis. We pray for those who have lost loved ones already and pray that you might extend to them your comfort and peace. We pray for those looking for a cure that, Lord, you might give them wisdom and guidance. We pray for our leaders that you might lead them as they seek to lead us and protect us and guide us through these days. And Lord, we pray for each of us wherever we are and the particular challenges we are facing emotionally or physically or financially, all the ways in which this crisis can stress us out. We pray that we might experience your comfort and peace, that you might assure us of your profound love for us. And as we come, I invite you, wherever you are, just to take a moment, just to talk about the things that you want to talk to God about. I'll give you a few moments to do that. And maybe what you need to talk to God about is that you need to say, God, I need to trust your love more. Or maybe I need to trust your love for the first time. And if you but reach out, God is there to reach back. In fact, God is already there with you now. Whatever concern you have, I invite you to bring it to God right now. And dear God, as we bring all these concerns to you, we remember the prayer you shared with us 
And as your beloved children, we boldly pray together wherever we are these words. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Let me first of all say a word of thank you to you. Thanks. Thanks because many of you have been faithfully giving to this ministry and we are so grateful for the gifts that you have given online, for the gifts that you have texted to us, for the gifts that you have put in the mail, all the ways in which you have supported this ministry financially. And we invite you to continue to do so, that we might continue to provide not only these worship gatherings, but all the other ministries that we're doing. Right now, we're looking at ways that we can further support those in need in the life of our community, either in health care or those who are dealing with financial stresses or, or food insecurity. And so as we discern what best ways we can be there for others, we'll let you know more about that. Keep in mind that we are still collecting our Easter offering, and that offering will go to some of those outreach efforts and also to the work in Haiti that we continue to do with orphans there that are dealing with another deadly virus, their HIV-positive orphans. And we pray that you give to that offering. Just go online. You just type in the, um, look for the one that says Easter campaign, and you can give directly to that giving emphasis during this Easter season. And with that, thank you once again for all the ways in which you continue to give to this church with your prayers and with your love and, yes, with your financial contributions. Please know that we're there for you. We're always just a phone call away. Send us a message on email, via text. Call us on the phone. Message us on Facebook. Whatever you need, please know that we are here for you. And... As we remember that, let us remember that God is here for us as well, always here for us with this offering of prayer. Let us pray together this prayer from Nicholas Lee. God of the open garden, we have found you and long to hold you fast, but you refuse our clinging need, eluding the love that would bind and possess you, sending us of our feeble knowing, wrapped in our joy and desire, cannot interpret you. You have gone from us again, moving into mourning, moving into light. In your great love, wait for us where you have sent us. Go ahead of us. Be there to meet us. Written, released in your world. And on our journey, Give us eyes to see and behold your presence even now among us. In Jesus' name we pray this. Amen. And now, as we do each week, we end with song. Song of celebration. I invite us to join together in that song as Javon leads us in the day of resurrection. Indeed, Jesus has brought us over with hymns of victory. 
For Jesus is with us in every moment. God is with us in every moment. And we can see it as close as the trees that lie outside our window. We can feel it in the love that God yearns to give us in every moment. So go forth and know that you don't have to know everything. None of us do. But we can know this, that God loves us. That this God is worthy of trust. Then those moments where we get fearful and insecure, we can say, God, you love us. And what we do not know, you do. And what we can know is this, that you love us. That you love each of us no matter what. And in that love, we are always invited, always welcomed, always loved. And now may that love go with you this day and always. And may the blessing of this God go with you. The God who loved you first. The God who in Jesus offered up everything for you. And the God who can do more in your life and in this world, even in these challenging days, than anything we could ever ask or dream or imagine. May the blessing of this God go with you this day and always. And let us end this gathering as we do each week with some notes of celebration as Jerry leads us out.